Uh, but we wrapped up uh, our series on uh, navigating doubt in the life of faith, of what it looks like uh, that we can still uh, turn to Jesus uh, and yet still work through some of the doubt that we may have in this life. Uh, we just wrapped that up, and we're going to start a short series on giving thanks. Uh, what does it look like to cultivate a heart, uh, a cultivating a, a grateful heart? And so for the next three weeks, we'll do that before our, our Advent series. And we're hoping that this is more than just a, a Thanksgiving series, right? Uh, since Thanksgiving uh, is right around the corner. Uh, and in fact, uh, cultivating a, a grateful heart is, is something that uh, a lot of people uh, study about. Um, there's this organization or a program or institute, that's what it is. It's an institute, uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, that just studies what does it look like to um, live a meaningful life. And so they're using all the, the tools and research uh, that the university offers, uh, and they're just gathering information. What does it look like for people to have a meaningful life? Uh, and one of those is a life of gratefulness, to be thankful. And here they, you know, during their study, they see their actual benefits uh, if one person is more grateful or living gratefully uh, in their life, there are physical uh, benefits, a uh, stronger immune system that you get to sleep more, you feel rested, you're more active, uh, and so there's some physical benefits to that. Uh, there are psychological benefits uh, as well, mental ones, uh, more positive emotions, uh, more alert, uh, more uh, joy or pleasure. Uh, and then with that, there's relational, social benefits uh, to this as well. And so here they're just listing, oh, uh, this can impact us in so uh, many ways. Uh, and this author says, uh, just takes a, a moment just to define what is gratitude. Uh, gratitude is first that there's a, a good thing. It's an affirmation of goodness uh, in your life, whether it's a small thing or, or a big thing. And second uh, is figuring out where that good thing came from. Who gave it to you? That that good thing is not just anything that you produce, right? He's affirming, it's like, you can't produce all the good things, right? Even though that you do good things, people have invested in you, have given you good things. And acknowledging those people. Uh, and even if it's a higher power, if there's some, a spiritual aspect, right, to acknowledge those things. And I believe followers of Jesus uh, have been trying to do this for generations. It's something that they have been trying to practice over and over and over again. In fact, uh, we started off a service uh, with the psalm that invites us to give thanks, right? To look to who God is uh, and to give thanks. And so that's what we're going to try to do for the next three weeks is we're going to turn uh, to our God uh, and see is there something for us to give thanks to. If you're not a follower of Jesus or, or maybe you're doubting uh, you're, you're, you're watching in, and, you're, uh, and there's like, you know, what, what, what do followers of Jesus have to be grateful for? I, I hope you ask that question. Is there something that Christians that are slightly different, uh, is there about something about Jesus uh, that people who turn to Jesus, is there something about them that they can be grateful for? Is, is it real, right? Is it authentic or is it just kind of fake, right? Sometimes we can, uh, Christians can be known for being plastic and fake, is it real? Uh, this morning we're going to look at this. Uh, this morning we're going to look how we can give thanks because we have been freed by God. And I'm going to turn to a couple passages. Uh, one is in 1 Corinthians 16, and then the next uh, is in Romans. 1 Corinthians. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now from Romans 6, 17. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and have been set free of sin, become slaves of righteousness. Let me pray. Father God, Lord, we just give you thanks for this time. Uh, give us ears to hear and eyes to see uh, what you have to say to us this morning. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen. So we're going to talk about gratefulness. We're going to talk about uh, giving thanks. But if you look at these passages, right, uh, they have a, a few words in there. It's like, what does that have to do 
with gratitude. What does that have to do with giving thanks? Uh, and three words uh, that I want to pay attention to, death, sin, and the law. What is it about those things that, uh, that we could talk about, about gratefulness, right? Why does the Bible, or why do people like me always have to bring up these topics? And what does that have to do with giving thanks? Why can't we just talk about acceptance? Why can't we talk about self-love? Why can't we talk about mercy? Why can't we talk about kindness and forgiveness? Those are wonderful things, right? Those are things that I want to give thanks for. Uh, a current author, I, I think she's still current because I read this book a long time ago. Uh, I feel like it's been a while. Uh, Brene Brown, uh, her first book, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection. Uh, and uh, she was, uh, I believe she's a sociologist, and she was doing research uh, to gathering information uh, of those people who, who felt like they were living wholehearted lives, uh, lives full of meaning. Uh, and she had a crisis in her life. She was realizing as she was gathering all this data that's just like, oh, wait, I'm not living this life. Uh, in this life, this wholehearted life is a life of acceptance, uh, a seeing that you have worth and beauty. And she was noticing that there's some barriers to this, something that she had to struggle with, that the barriers to this are guilt, shame, and judgment. When we talk about the law, when we talk about sin, when we talk about death, uh, when, when I look at those things, don't, don't we think those are barriers to that? Or, or uh, barriers to worthiness, uh, to acceptance? And in fact, it seems to actually enforce or build up more guilt, more shame, and definitely judgment. Again, why can't we just talk about self-love, talk about accepting people for who they are, to accept myself for who I am, right? That, th those are wonderful and good things. But yet in the midst of that, as we talk about acceptance, accepting ourselves for who we are in the midst of all of our imperfection, I'm just wondering if you can be honest, is that message enough? Is that enough? Is that going to work? The last two or three years, uh, there is this, we have seen this deep need for justice and righteousness, right? There's been this deep need for accountability uh, to be for those uh, who have abused their power, who have taken advantage of others, who have misused their money to gather their own, to, ga to, to gather more money and take away from others, uh, to take the voice away from others, to remove people's rights, that people have experienced prejudice and bias. And so there's been this outcry of injustice and unrighteousness. And there's this longing for correction accountability. So here we have these two messages, acceptance and belonging, and then justice and righteousness. Can these two things come together? Can I accept someone if they have wronged me or they have done a great wrong? Can I just accept them for who they are? Can I live a life of righteousness and justice without judging people or creating barriers with people? I think Paul, the follower of Jesus, helps us. He helps us here. He points us to the heart of the problem. He points us to death. And here, this death, he's talking about a physical death, but he's not just talking about a physical death. He's talking more than that. He's talking about a spiritual death. What do I mean by a spiritual death? That in this life, there is a corrupting and rotting of all good things in this world. That's what we're experiencing. That's what we're even experiencing with this tension of justice and righteousness and acceptance. There's a longing uh, there's a, an experience of something wrong in this world. And here Paul points us that the sting of death is sin. What does he mean by that? Sin is the poison that brings about death. Paul somewhere else says the wages of sin is death. And yet he takes another step. He said the power of sin is the law. The law is what gives sin its power. Now, if you think about that, that can be kind of confusing, right? Because sometimes the Bible talks about the law and it's like, hey, this is a wonderful and amazing thing. You should follow that. And other times, like, like here, it's just like, hey, by the way, the law, uh, it actually empowers sin. It empowers 
all the wrong in the world, which then leads to death. What, what is going on here? I think it would help us to understand what is sin. Some, a lot of times when you co- come into a place like this, you, people, uh, we, like people like me up here will just throw around words like sin. And we're like, wait, what does that actually mean? And so we're going to try to talk about that. Uh, And oftentimes when we think of sin or evil, right, it's like the anti-good. It's the opposite of good. It's the yin of the yang. If sin is the dark side, right, good is the light. It's like the opposite. And I think there's actually uh, something wrong with that uh, definition. If I can try to be a little philosophical here, that, that is not my strength. I am not a philosopher. Uh, I depend upon others, and for those of you who are, uh, please forgive me as I try to enter into this conversation. Uh, But here, just to help us try to understand what is sin, uh, one way to say it is that sin is dependent upon good things. Sin is dependent upon the law, but good is independent from sin. What do I mean by that? Uh, For good to exist, there doesn't need to be sin, but sin rests on good. It is a distortion of the good thing. It is the destruction of the, the good thing. I only know what sin is is because it's been, uh, it's been a twisting or distortion of that good thing. It is a transgression against the law, a breaking of those good things. So if I could offer a, a crude example here. So I finished my basement uh, a couple of years ago, and I really wanted to do a good job, right? I really wanted to do a good job of, of doing this project uh, for my family. And so I'm trying to, I got to put up studs uh, against the wall. And so I'm thinking, you know what? All right, I want to do a good job, right? And so I want to use the prettiest and most expensive tool that I have to put together these studs, these pieces of wood together. All right, I'm going to use my MacBook Pro because that makes sense, right? It's the prettiest and most expensive tool I have. And so I'm going to take this MacBook, this computer, and try to hammer in these boards together. Now, what's going to happen if I do that? One, I'm going to break my laptop. Two, I'm, I'm probably not going to actually build anything because it's not, it doesn't work as a great hammer. What happened? I took a good thing. And I distorted it, and I destroyed that good thing. The interesting thing is when we are faced with hardship, uh, when we're faced with wrongness, confusion, anxiety, and fear, I don't know about you, but I want to fix it. I want to fix it. And when I try to fix it, right, or when I try to protect myself, I create rules and regulations and boundaries and laws to try to protect myself. So, for example... Uh, the church community, Christians, followers of Jesus, uh, about 20, 30 years ago, uh, they responded to the sexual revolution in a certain way. Where it's like, hey, there's a, an issue uh, going on over here. And so you know what? We're going to try to create a purity culture. So for the last 20, 30 years, uh, the church has tried to encourage its young people and those within their community. It's like, hey, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus and be pure, to be wholesome, to be untainted. And so in the midst of that, they create a lot of Boundaries and rules, they don't do that, but do this. Do this, but don't do that. And even its best intentions, unfortunately, it's brought about a lot of shame. It's brought about a lot of guilt and a lot of judgment. And also, it's brought around a wrong message about the body, a wrong message about sex, a wrong message about grace. And a wrong message about who God is. Okay, so if those laws and those rules aren't working, let's just accept people, right? Let's just accept people for who they are with all their mistakes and who they are. But if you start thinking about that, you got to start asking some questions. Well, who gets accepted? When or how are people accepted? Uh, what if someone doesn't feel accepted? What does it mean to actually be accepted? And what do we do if someone who he accepts then hurts someone else? So here in the midst of creating an accepting culture, we're back. More rules, more boundaries, more laws. Religious groups aren't the only ones that do this, right? I think any 
You put, you put human beings together, this is what we do, right? We think about our political culture and climate, right? This is what we're doing, right? We're saying, hey, there's a problem in this world. And so people are taking sides and saying, hey, this is what it means to fix things. And you know what? This is what it means to be a strong proponent of this message. Tote the party line. This is what it looks like to be for our country, to fix things. We do this in political climates. We do this in our family systems. More rules and laws. And yet, at the same time, even in its best intentions, it can't save us. It can't fix us. And it won't free us. Back to my silly example. I had a lot of friends come to help me because I didn't know what I was doing to help me uh, fix, uh, to build my basement. And so what if they see me taking my laptop and trying to hammer a nail uh, in, 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 uh, by putting some studs together. It's like, hey, you know what? That's not what you use a computer for. I'm sorry. L let me tell you how you use a computer. You know what? It's used for writing Word documents. It's for making PowerPoint presentations. It's for writing emails. And you know what? To keep you from making the same mistake again, actually, only use your computer for those three things. But, you know, I heard that you can play games on this thing. I, I like playing games. Can I play games on this computer? It's like, you know what? I, I wouldn't do that because it's a slippery slope because you might get confused in the midst of playing games on your computer and you're like, you know what, I need a Frisbee. That's a game. I'm going to use my laptop as a Frisbee. Right? So let's just, let's just, I don't want you to get confused again. So uh, don't do that. And even again, in the midst of all the best intentions, the funny thing is, is I'm still left with what? A broken laptop. Rules laws, regulations, they cannot fix us. They can show us our messiness. It can point out our brokenness and even empower us to do more messy things that leads to more death and destruction. Here, Paul, I think, helps us. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us victory in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we are offered just and righteous acceptance. In Jesus, we are offered just belonging. Imagine this uh, between two political parties. Let's say the strongest voice, uh, the most noblest and faithful voice on the progressive side does this. They cross party lines. They cross over into the enemy side. And he says, I am now one of you. I belong to you. You're one of mine now. And all the shame, all the condemnation that you have received, all the judgment that you have received, all, all the mistakes that you have made in your best intentions or your worst moments, I'm now just going to, they're, they're mine. I'm going to take them on. Why? Because I want you to know that you're loved and that you are accepted. But also so that you may be justified this is what Jesus does for us. All the accusations, all the guilt, all the just judgment that belongs to us. He says, I take it on. He does, he does not ignore the wrong. Jesus demands for justice. And he takes that demand on himself. He paid for it. This is victory. This is freedom. How does a man who wants was the strongest enemy for those who followed Jesus. Those who were following Jesus, he arrested, he condemned, he even put to death and delighted in it. How does this man, why does this man change his life so dramatically? Paul, who was one Saul, says this, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God in Christ Paul knows that he stands victorious. He stands free from his sin. He's free from the law that condemns him. And that he is freely accepted and justified. And so he can say with confidence, I am the chief of sinners. He knows that he lived a life that brought about death and destruction. I am the chief of sinners. His offense was real, but also so is the freedom given to us in Christ 
the freedom given to us by God's grace. But also, how does a community, how does a community of people who, was, who were chased by this man, terrorized by this man, friends and family were murdered by this man, how do they accept him? How do they not only accept him and welcome, they allow him to be a leader and a spokesperson on their behalf. They needed a little help from Jesus. But you see, they're reminded that they received justice. God received justice. All of Paul's sins were paid for on the cross. The same God that they were giving thanks to for his just, for their own just welcome, is the same God that Paul turned to and gave thanks to as well. I want to invite uh, Stephanie and our worship team to come back up. And I just want us to meditate on this just acceptance, this just and righteous belonging in Jesus. that, That in Christ, do you have something to give thanks for? Even no matter what's going on in your life around you. That you get to stand, say, yes, I belong to him. Even despite all the things that I've done, that I have just belonging in him. And then when we come back, uh, we'll briefly talk about what else we are free to do in Christ. There was once a man who lived a very comfortable and luxurious life. He had money. He had power. He had connections and relationships to power. But he used those resources take away, to steal, to betray his own people, his own community, to accumulate more wealth, more comfort, more money. Why? Why does he do that? Because he loved money. He loved his comfort. This is the story of Zacchaeus that we read about earlier. Maybe if we put, that, put this in a more modern context, imagine a Jewish man allying himself with the Nazis so that he could live a comfortable life, so that he could have access to wealth and luxury. This is what Zacchaeus does. He aligns himself with the oppressing government so that he could use that power and get more. And everyone knew it. He knew it. And everyone hated him. And then Jesus enters the picture. And just like everyone else, he's like, who is this guy? What's all the hype about this man, Jesus? And so he goes with the crowd trying to figure out, trying to get a look at who Jesus is. And Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And he welcomes him. What happens to Zacchaeus when he experiences the welcome of Jesus. He turns and says, Jesus, look, I'm going to take my wealth. I'm going to give half of it to the poor. And then anyone that I've defrauded, anything, anyone that I stole money for, not only am I going to give them their money back, I'm going to pay four times what I stole to them. Why does a guy do that? I mean, by the end, he's probably a poor man. Why does he do that? Is he trying to earn Jesus' favor? Is he trying to pay back? He has this shame. He experiences this condemnation. He's like, you know what? Maybe people will like me again if I do this. It says after Jesus welcomes him that he left, that he accepted him with joy. Zacchaeus experienced joy because he knew not only did he, like, Everyone knew that that man was a sinner. But, but he also knew. He knew. He knew that he was taken from other people. He knew. And yet this man, despite all of that, welcomes him. And so there was joy. I think Paul helps us further what's going on in the life of Zacchaeus. Uh, he is freed from his sin. Thanks be to God. You were once slaves of sin. He was enslaved by his love of money. He was enslaved by his greed. And therefore he was enslaved by his guilt and condemnation. But thanks be to God. You were once slaves. But now have 
become obedient from the heart to a new master, to a new way. He's turned to Jesus. He's turned and says, you know what? Not only am I free from this, now I get to live a new life. I get to live a just and righteous life. And so with joy, with joy, things that he was consumed about, that he took away from others, he freely, he was set free to give away. This is what Jesus offers us. We are free not just from sin and guilt and shame. We're now free to pursue a new life, to live a righteous life based on our acceptance, based on Jesus' belonging, based on grace. So we get to join with so many people who say in the Bible, it's like, Lord God, I delight in your law. Lord, I long to learn. Teach me your ways. I love these words. Why? How can they say these things? Because before we just saw that the law binds us. It brings us down. Why? How do they say these words? Because they no longer see God. And they no longer see as the law as condemning. Because they have victory. They had been freed by Christ and so the law no longer condemns. And now they're free. It's like, I want, to, I want to follow you. I want to hear your words. Please show me this righteous and wonderful life. So we get to join someone like Zacchaeus. That there's joy. Thanks be to God. He has freed us. Thanks be to God that we are free to a new purpose, to a new life, a righteous and just life. We look back, what is gratitude? See something. There's something good. Is there something good in Christ? In Christ we have been freed. We are victorious over our sin. We are victorious over death. That the law no longer condemns us. In Christ, we are free, not burdened, not overwhelmed. We are free to live a, a righteous and just life. And then who gave it to us? I can't do this. I just make more mistakes. I, I make more laws and rules, regulations maybe to protect myself and those in my life. I know that you guys can't do it for me, even though I would love for you to do and try. <laughs> but it's Jesus. It is our God who has freed us. And so we get to turn to him and experience that freedom. We get to meditate on that and say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for his just welcome, for his just acceptance that we have in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus who has freed us, who has freed us from our sin, from our guilt and our condemnation, and who empowers us and continues to empower us to try to let go of these things. And turn to follow you. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a life that experiences this freedom. We pray this in your name. Amen.